20% increase in salary and 2% stake in the company. Kaboom! There it is. Look at the balls on you. Nobody leaves a negotiation happy. Is the show over? It's not negotiable. Let's talk about business and finance lessons from the sixth episode of Billy in season two, based on my work experience at Goldman Sachs in New York City, and based on my work experience at the top hedge funds in the world. Now, please like, comment, and subscribe, and stick around, because at the end of this video, I'm gonna grade the episode for Wall Street Realism with a buy, hold, or sell rating. Now, in this video, we will discuss how you can ask for a raise or a promotion, or how to get a better job. But first, let's discuss how to negotiate your compensation when joining a new company. In this episode, Axe's former employee, Wendy, is negotiating her compensation package to return to work for Axe Capital. And when negotiating, she asks for more than she thinks that Axe will give her. 20% increase in salary and 2% stake in the company. And she knows that she will get a 20% increase in salary but definitely not the 2% ownership in the company. But she still uses this as leverage, as we can see right here. Yes on the comp, no on the stake. No one owns any of it but me. Buy profit share and payout equal to 1% in the case of a sale. Now, Bobby will never sell his company, and she knows that. But at least Wendy gets profit sharing. Now, if Wendy did not ask for the 2% stake in the company, then Axe might have tried to negotiate down the 20% increase in compensation. And negotiations are really tough because you have to use game theory and think about the compensation range that the other party might be thinking of before your meeting. Let's offer five, lowest I'll go is 18. And if you don't use game theory to anticipate the likely range of outcomes that your opponent is considering, then this could happen. He's not even gonna negotiate if that's on the table. Now, in this episode, Bobby tries to buy property very near a casino for $1.5 million. And the property owner uses game theory negotiation tactics brilliantly to get Bobby to pay much more than $1.5 million. I'll double the offer. Seven. Yeah, I think I'd be happy at seven. Nobody leaves a negotiation happy. Five. So when negotiating your compensation when joining a new company, let them bring up the compensation topic towards the end. Then what they, when they ask you what you're expecting to make for your salary, I want you to mention what you're currently making. However, I want you to do it like this. First of all, before you give them a number, calculate what your total compensation package is where you work right now, including your base salary and all benefits and use that number only. For example, let's say you make a base salary of $100,000 right now, and the firm you're currently working at matches $10,000 in your annual retirement contributions. Plus the company you work at gives you $10,000 in annual life or health insurance. Plus the company gives you $20,000 in deferred stock compensation. And plus the firm that you're now at subsidizes $10,000 of daycare and other benefits per year. So this means that your compensation package is not $100,000 because it's actually $150,000. And this is legitimate because if they drill down and ask you for more details on your compensation package, you can mention all this stuff that we just mentioned. And you can also go to websites like glassdoor.com or Reddit or Quora and find out what employees make for the positions that you're interviewing for. I've got a really important side note. If you join a company and you're given the option to receive more base salary or more in options, always choose a higher base salary because it costs the company nothing to create more stock options. And they're likely gonna give you new stock options every single year anyway. Don't say you don't want any options though, or they'll think that you don't believe in the long-term vision of the company. Just go for a higher base salary. Now, before we chat about how to get a raise or a promotion or a better job, when you join a new company, especially if it's a smaller firm, please do not sign the contract they give you until you have your lawyer read it like what Wendy did right here. Did your lawyer look through his papers? He said it's fine, do you have a pen? Why is it crucial that you hire your own lawyer to read your contract before you sign it? Because the lawyer that created the contract represents your future employer and not you and lawyers are always so biased to protect their clients. 
And I always do this and it has literally saved me seven figures. And the most cost-effective way to hire a lawyer, and I, I never let anybody sponsor my videos, but what you can do is you can go to LegalZoom.com and hire a lawyer to review your contract before you sign it. And don't ever take a full-time job without getting a contract, even if you trust the person that you're gonna work for, because they might not always be around. I need you to write her a contract. That'll be the only one at the firm. That's not accurate. There's no way in a highly regulated and litigious industry that nobody in the firm would have a contract. Now, before we talk about how to ask for a raise or a promotion or a new job, please understand that many rich people are very cheap. And as a result, if you get way less than what you expected to get from your first bonus check, then please find another job because one data point makes a trend when it comes to cheap, rich employers. Let's talk about the best way to get a raise or a promotion. So when your boss congratulates you on a job well done and they're in a really good mood, I want you to say this, thank you. Do you have a few seconds to grab a coffee? Then in that meeting, I want you to start with this if true. I really enjoy our team and together we've accomplished a lot, but as you know, it's really expensive to raise a family here and I wanna provide the best standard of living and opportunities for my children. As a result, I'd love to ask you to please let me know what additional value I need to add to our team in order to get considered for a promotion or a raise. And your boss will let will tell you the criteria. And of course, you're gonna write all this stuff down. And then of course, thank them for their time. Then in a couple of months or longer, once your boss congratulates you again on a job well done, then say thank you so much. Do you have a few seconds for a coffee? Then in that meeting, you start the same way if true with something like, our team has accomplished so much and I'm really optimistic about our outlook. Then say this if true. When we met a few months ago, I asked for guidance on what I need to accomplish in order to be considered for a raise or promotion as I wanna provide for my family. And I'm very humbled to say that I've fulfilled all the criteria that we spoke about and I wanna please ask you for a raise or a promotion. And please remember that closed mouths don't get fed. And the secret to getting promoted behind closed doors is all those vice presidents at your company have done exactly what I just explained. They've asked several times for a promotion. You know, asking you'll receive, it's prophetic, it's been true since the beginning of time. Now, if you're frustrated at work because people around you are getting promoted faster than you, there's a good chance it's because they asked many times behind closed doors. Now, Regardless of whether or not you think you're ready to be promoted, I still want you to meet with your manager at least once a quarter and ask for feedback on how you can add more value. And I say all of this because if you do this consistently, then the probability of you losing your job goes down materially and subconsciously, it actually lets your boss know that you're in this for the long run and you're not a flight risk. Separately. If you work at a company that has a human resources department, what you can do is you can often access documents that clearly outline what you need to accomplish in order to get promoted. And of course, you can use that as your guide. And as you look through the criteria for promotion, then using your daily scheduling system, and I have a system like this that I give all my students, but using your daily scheduling students, I want you to schedule your day every day and tell yourself this, okay? Everything I'm gonna schedule for the day, within reason, needs to get me closer to accomplishing the criteria to get promoted, and everything else I do is a waste of time that day at work, relatively speaking. And I know it's not easy to think that way, but thinking that way will force you to be laser focused on getting promoted and network internally at your company to get more mentors to help you understand how to get promoted. And by far the best mentor that you can get is your boss's assistant. Because your boss's assistant has likely worked with your boss for many years and at many companies. And the assistant will love to mentor you and help you if you ask. Plus, they know how the boss makes decisions and they will be so flattered that you ask them to mentor you. Also, if you're really close to getting promoted, you need to ensure that you're doing the job at least one level above you. And as crazy as this sounds, 
I want you to dress the way somebody would one level above you because perception becomes reality. Lastly, let's discuss how to get another job. Now, networking is everything. Now, when you see a job opening online, statistically, you have a one in 250 chance of getting that job. So who usually gets that job? Well, it's usually somebody that knows people at the company. So don't apply to companies the old fashioned way. Instead, what I want you to do is network like crazy because relationships are always more important than product knowledge. So here's how you do it. Step one, have an incredible LinkedIn profile, which I teach in my courses. Step two, identify the company you wanna work at. Let's say it's Morgan Stanley, for example. Step three, do an advanced search in LinkedIn for two things you have in common with 30 people that work at Morgan Stanley. For example, let's say you grew up in Vancouver and you went to XYZ high school and you're a member of a certain club. Now, if you find someone at LinkedIn when searching LinkedIn that also went to your high school and is a member of the same club, then you can reach out to them and send an in-mail to this person saying exactly this. John. Hope all is well. I also went to XYZ High School and I'm also in the X Club or something you have in common with them. Then I want you to write this. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee or a Zoom meeting. Thanks, Chris. Say nothing else. And don't send emails because nobody read them, reads them. Send emails because you've read every email ever sent to you. Now, why would that person take that meeting with you? Well, I want you to think of it this way. Let's imagine it's now 20 years in the future and you're way more successful than you are today. And somebody 20 years younger than you, who is really similar to you, reaches out to you. Would you take that meeting? Of course you would. Now set up 30 meetings at each company you want to work at. And if you're thinking, yeah, but you know what, Chris, that's a lot of work, eh? Then I want you to ask yourself this. I say this with love in my heart as always. How badly do you want that job? Your competition will not be doing this. Now, what do you do in the first 10 minutes of that meeting or so? Well, at first you bond. You always bond before business. You talk about what you have in common, like talk about the restaurant that has been on Main Street or on campus forever, or talk about the sports team from your school, or better yet, go to their Insta or X, meaning Twitter profile, to see who they follow before the meeting so you know what to talk about. Then after 10 minutes in the meeting, the person you're meeting with will say something like this, and they won't say it as harshly as I'm about to say, but they'll say something like, why are we meeting? Then you tell them that you're passionate about working at Morgan Stanley, and of course say why, and you would love to get some advice on how to apply to work at Morgan Stanley. And they will help you. And if they say they aren't hiring, then what you say is this, do you know anybody else that also went to our school that is hiring in finance? Now, do this 30 times for each company you want to work at, and I promise you, you will eventually get that coveted job. And remember, you only have to be right in business one time. And it's kind of like dating. You're going to get a date if you keep asking. Let's talk about grading of this episode for Wall Street Realism with a buy, hold, or sell rating. The episode did a great job of showing the negotiation process with Wendy negotiating her salary, Axe negotiating to buy land, and even legal negotiations. However, there's no way that Wendy would be the first person to get a contract from Axe Capital. As a result, I'm going to give this episode a hold rating. Please subscribe, and I will see you soon in our next reaction video when we react to Season 2, Episode 7. Thank you.